Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and I always start with a few announcements on Tuesday. First of all, we have another free workshop coming up on October 3rd. It's with Dr. Kathy Waller and a true opportunity to get an hour's worth of information on vaccines for free. Uh, Dr. Waller has created a really wonderful evidence-based course for us that looks at this issue and um, it is a complicated one and one that should be examined from a scientific perspective instead of with all the rhetoric and screaming and hollering that seems to accompany it every place you go. So this is on October 3rd and, um, and you'll, you'll We'll actually take questions from the group and, and that sort of thing, but this is a chance to get a preview and some free information about this very important issue. The second thing is I'm starting another mentoring group in October, and if you've never participated in professional mentoring, if you're involved in some health-related field, uh, basically we teach business and health skills, and, um, and skills for helping others improve their health. And this is everything from writing business plans, writing presentations that are effective, delivering presentations, communication skills, to clinical skills and helping people to analyze their health status, how to do health consulting, um, how to look at research articles and all kinds of things related to how to deliver care. And that care can be anything from teaching yoga classes to being a medical doctor in practice. So uh, this is a six month hands-on program. It's done uh, through virtual classroom, uh, interactive conference call. You do not have to come to Columbus. So you may have some interest in that. And then uh, last but not least, we are just a few weeks away from our 20th anniversary conference. Um, which is uh, going to be here in Columbus, Ohio. And boy, do we have an all-star lineup. Dr. Peter Bregan, the author of over 20 books on psychiatric drugs and how to deliver good uh, mental health um, care to people. Uh, we have Thomas Seyfried, who's a geneticist and who's going to explain to you why cancer is not a genetic disease. We have Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Dr. Neil Barnard, Dr. Marielle Von Lanthan, Dr. Janice Stenger. We're going to talk about a lot of topics you don't hear at other conferences like diet and pregnancy and diet and reflux and um, the list goes on and on. So anyway, you definitely don't want to miss it. It's an unforgettable weekend with fabulous meals and we're going to have one amazing party on Saturday night because 20 years is kind of a big deal. You know what I mean? All right, so um, let's get into today's topics and the first one is everybody agrees that parents and other adults have a big and profound influence on ideas that babies and children develop about everything including food. What I think will surprise you is that how early babies begin to understand something about the food choices that their parents and other adults in their lives make. In order to evaluate how food-related behavior impacts babies, researchers invited over 200 one-year-olds and their parents to participate in an experiment. The researchers knew that you couldn't just sit down and ask babies what they think about things, but what we do know about babies is that what they choose to look at and how long they pay attention to it is an indication of what they are thinking. So in the lab, one group of babies first watched videos of people showing that they liked or disliked a particular food. So, for example, the babies were shown a video of somebody eating a food and, and demonstrating that she really loved it, and then shown another video uh, with a second person expressing equal love for the same food. Well, the babies didn't really pay much attention to the second video because having watched the first person really like the food, they expected that the second person would too, so it really, really didn't capture their attention. But when the experiment was repeated with another group of babies who was first shown a video of somebody loving the food, and then the second video showed somebody disliking, clearly disliking that same food, the babies looked at the second video longer. They were curious. They were surprised when the second person showed dislike for a food that somebody previously had liked. Well, in further experiments observing babies' reactions, researchers identified, identified some other patterns. If two people seem to be friends and or they spoke the same language, baby ex babies expected that both would like the same foods. But if two people appeared to dislike each other and or spoke different languages, babies expected that they would not like the same foods. In other words, at a very early age, babies are able to recognize cultural differences and what those mean. In this case, that similar people will like similar foods. What was even more interesting is the babies didn't have any reaction at all to watching people liking and disliking non-food items. They had some type of understanding that food was different than other types of things that people might like or dislike. 
There was a further distinction with food, which was that babies seemed to understand that some foods might just be disgusting to everybody, regardless of culture. When they watched somebody act disgusted, different response than dislike, they expected that the second person would also be disgusted, regardless of whether or not they spoke the same language or were part of the same cultural group. So how did babies determine cultural differences? Well, babies from homes in which only English was spoken determined that speaking a different language was a marker for belonging to a different group. And they expected that if you belong to different groups, you might not like the same foods. On the other hand, babies from bilingual homes assumed that people who spoke different languages would like similar things. Different social backgrounds, in other words, resulted in different assumptions. The researchers stated that parents should be mindful since infants don't just learn to eat the food that they're given, but they also learn a lot about food by watching adults eat. Now, it has been said that children often choose not to do what the adults in their lives tell them to do, but they almost never fail to imitate behaviors of the adults and parents in their lives. So, the modeling of eating habits makes a big impression on kids starting at a very, very early age. And I don't think that anybody disagrees with that. I'm just not sure that most people know how to act on it in order to instill healthy behaviors in uh, children so that they track into adulthood with those healthy behaviors. And I guess what this study shows is, boy, it is never too early to pay attention. Okay, next topic. The longer a person is overweight, the higher the risk of developing cancers for which obesity is a risk factor. I would argue that obesity is a risk factor for all of them, but in this particular study, only a few were looked at. The authors from the International Agency for Research on Cancer say that theirs is the first study that looked at the impact of obesity duration on the risk of cancer. So that was a little bit different twist. So the data were drawn from participants in the Women's Health Initiative and showed that for every 10 years spent being overweight as an adult, risk increased by an average of 7% for cancers that are related to obesity. There were over 79,000 women included in the study. They were postmenopausal, and their ages were between 50 and 79 years of age. 40% of the women were never overweight. The other 60% were overweight, and almost half of them were obese. The overweight women had been that way for an average of 30 years. The obese women for an average of 20 years. And during 12.6 years of follow-up, there were over 6,300 obesity-related cancers diagnosed. The risk was highest for endometrial cancer and kidney cancer. The effect was not only related to the amount of time spent obese, but also the degree of obesity. For example, for every 10 years a woman spent with a BMI 10 units above normal weight, the risk of endometrial cancer went up by 37%. The association between how long a woman spent being obese and increased developing all cancers was stronger than the association between how long a woman was overweight. So there was definitely a dose-dependent effect, and the more overweight a woman was, um, and the longer uh, she was overweight, the higher the risk factors. The study illustrates my point that weight loss is not just a matter of improving one's appearance, but it's also really a matter of saving one's life in some instances. While many government agencies and health organizations um, are expressing concern, and it's justifiable, about the increasing incidence of all kinds of disease, uh, nobody is really um, proposing any new ideas of how, how, to de how to address one of the major underlying issues, which is overweight and obesity. In other words, it's all well and good to say we need to do some things to prevent cancer. But when two-thirds of the people in the United States and a growing percentage of people worldwide are overweight or obese, and that's a major risk factor, not just for cancer, but for so many other diseases, at some point in time, that discussion has got to go to the top of the list and something needs to be done about it. The problem is that the failure rate for weight loss programs in the long term is over 95%. If we ever hope to solve our crisis, I think we're, in terms of healthcare, we're going to have to come up with some better strategies for helping people to lose weight and maintain weight loss. And I've been saying this for years, and I know I aggravate some of my colleagues. When you have a failure rate that is as high as this 95%, we can't any longer blame it on the people who are buying the programs that we're selling. I'm sure that they have some responsibility on the matter, but so do we as healthcare professionals. It's up to us to throw out better ideas and to try new things until we come up with something that works. Now, 
One of the clues, um, or a source of clues, I should say, uh, for what we might do differently comes from the National Weight Loss Registry, a database of over 3,000 people who've maintained weight loss for a long period of time, usually an average of 5.5 years. Um, these 3,000 people, and successful at that because, again, the weight loss statistics are terrible, um, some things they have in common is that they did not use low-carb diets. They used low-fat and lower-calorie diets. Almost 80% eat breakfast every day, 75% weigh themselves once a week or more, and 90% of them exercise an hour a day or more. So, you know, one of the things that we might do, and I'm always aggravated when I watch policymakers and, and healthcare professionals, everybody just, you know, I, we don't know what to do. Start by asking people to help you who have experienced some success. Let's interview these people and find out some other things about what makes them tick. I'll tell you another thing in looking through the data on the weight loss registry is almost all of these people had tried numerous weight loss programs before, and almost all of them were not involved in a weight loss program per se, but they had taken information they'd gotten from various sources and made up their own plan. So the fact that withdrawal from the existing weight loss system seems to be a factor, I think we should consider that too. But anyway, let's interview these people and find out what else they have to say about how to lose weight and then maybe we could even use them, perhaps draft some of them into helping an effort to help others because it's helpful for someone to have role models uh, who have been successful at that which you're trying to do, in this case, weight loss. But, um, you know, that never happens. You know, it's, it's uh, just astounding. Things that make sense um, often don't happen in uh, policy-related matters, in education, and healthcare. Um, that doesn't happen. But we can certainly use forums like this to talk to people about these issues. Now, we have been doing a lot of experimenting here. We realized a few years ago that this business of just telling people to eat less and exercise more was a path to nowhere. And so we are using a lot of different ideas here, and we're seeing some better success. I would love to tell you that we have it all figured out. We don't. I don't think anybody has it all figured out. So if they're telling you that, they're probably blowing smoke and you know where, right? But, um, uh, but we have found that by approaching this a little different way, have moving the discussion to a different place, that we are helping people achieve some success. And who knows, maybe one day the World Health Organization or one of these organizations will get in touch with us and ask for our advice. Wouldn't that be a fun day? Well, that's all for now. Um, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.